This Wednesday, we're having a night of worship and prayer right here in the building. We love to worship, and opportunities like this where we get to come together and seek His presence as a body are so special. The doors will open at 6, and we'll get started at 6.30. So come and join us on the 17th. What's up, church? Hey, we are so excited to let you know that on Friday, March 5th, we're going to have our next team night. This is for anyone that serves on any of our teams here at Mission Church. So if you lead a group, if you are part of the greeting team, the worship team, the kids team, any team whatsoever, we want to celebrate with you. We want to honor you and thank you. We want to share some exciting things with you. Uh, so make sure to mark your calendars for March 5th, and we'll have a whole lot more information coming soon. We cannot wait to celebrate with you guys that night.
Good morning, Mission. It is a cold one out there this morning. If you're new to Mission or just want to get plugged in, please text START NOW, that's all one word, to 94000 to get connected. Have a great morning. Bye, guys. Good morning, Mission. I'm grateful to be serving you in this way this morning. If we haven't had the chance to meet, my name is Michelle Schubert, and I get the absolute privilege of getting to serve as one of the staff pastors here at Mission. Our lead pastors, Ezra and Kendra, are enjoying a Valentine's Day weekend away. I, for one, am so grateful to serve alongside leadership that prioritizes their commitment to their family and to their spouse first, that they honor the Lord by honoring and caring for their family. So we're grateful for them today that they're leading the way through biblical example of how to care and uh, take care of their family. Will you pray with me this morning? Lord, thank you so much for what you are already beginning to speak to our hearts today. Would you remove any of my words that aren't of you? Would you speak directly to the hearts of the people who are watching and help them to hear the exact message that you have created for them, that you see them right where they're at and you're speaking directly to them this morning? We thank you for your presence. We thank you for the way that you'll teach us and just guide us this morning, Lord. We praise you and love you. We give it all to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, today on this Valentine's Day, we're going to be talking about relationships. Uh, This isn't just for dating or married couples though, so stay with me if you're not, because if you are a human here, you're gonna find yourself in relationship with others. So today is for everyone. And I think that we've been in a transitional period of time where we've come to know the real and deep need for relationships in our lives. For myself, over this past year, uh, within some of the difficulties that we've faced maybe differently, and also through the difficulties that we've faced collectively, relationships were what anchored me to my relationship with Jesus and what tethered me back to who I am when I maybe felt a little lost. When we can get so micro-focused on what is right in front of us, sometimes only seeing that that glass is half empty, right? Relationships can help us kind of pull back and take a different view. So then we can recognize we've got water. Jesus exampled this to us best, and he did it in a way that is and always has been countercultural. If you have your Bible, would you open it up to Mark? We're going to be in chapter 2, and today we'll start in verse 18. It says, Once when John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, some people came to Jesus and asked, Why don't your disciples fast like John's disciples and the Pharisees do? Jesus replied, Do wedding guests fast while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. They can't fast while the groom is with them, but someday the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. So we can assume during this time, this moment may have fallen on a period of time during the week, that Jewish law would have dictated that the Jews be fasting. The Pharisees could have been drawing attention to that. Uh, Simultaneously, John was jailed at this time, so John's disciples could have been fasting for that reason, and they're drawing parallels between John's disciples and Jesus' disciples, wondering why they weren't participating in the fast. Jesus uses this metaphor of the groom's party being with him on the wedding to give explanation as to why they wouldn't be fasting. 
And while we understand this metaphor today in a post-New Testament uh, world as a reference to Jesus' relationship to us, the church, his bride, this was some new language for the Pharisees. By using this metaphor that they understood, actually using a law that they understood, See, in this culture, whether it was appropriate time to be fasting for a festival, a remembrance, or a day, you wouldn't fast during a wedding because of the incredible celebration that it was. He wanted to draw their attention to know that being in Jesus' presence was precedent. He meets them where they are with what they understand to introduce himself as the groom to the bride, the savior, the Messiah that they'd been waiting for. And he leads to his leaving them, his dying on the cross. He points towards it to explain to them the value of presence rather than perfection. See, this is our rule of relationship. Love over law. Hosea 6.6 6 says, I want you to show love, not offer sacrifices. I want you to know me more than I want burnt offerings. Love over law, presence over perfection. The first thing we need to do when walking out our relationships with others, church, is to remain in training. Just as the disciples were doing here by being with Jesus and learning from him, we ought to do the same. Because not so different than the Pharisees, this idea that more or better accomplishment earns you more is pretty similar to the traps that we can even fall in today. Grace was and is found in Jesus. Not the completion of laws and the order that they had and that we can sometimes impose on others. He had come to fulfill it, to be the fulfillment of the law. And this was new. He goes on to explain that in Mark 2, verse 21. He says, Besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. For the wine would burst the wineskins, and the wine and the skins would both be lost. He again meets them where they're at. Using a reference that they would understand, I am teaching you something new. Proximity over performance. Love over law. We need constant reminding of this because this goes against how we even function today. Comparison and competition is all around us. So we need training. We have to read and apply. Be doers, not just hearers of the word. Any athlete would tell you that to fully participate in game day, their body has to be conditioned for what they'll face. It isn't simply just enough to read about conditioning and how their muscles will end up operating when they're out on the field and then just show up and do it. Trust me, I am queen of this specific example. I can read everything on the internet, all of the blogs about getting toned and actually feel pretty good about what I'm gonna show up and do in the gym. And then when I get there, my body tells me something completely different. I should have prepared. I should have conditioned for what it is that I'm trying to do. It wasn't enough. So they have to show up and train. They have to practice using and stretching their muscles, pushing them to the limits for their body to do what it was designed to do under high pressure circumstances. To walk out the rule of relationship, love over law, we need conditioning. Even relationships can end up being high pressure environments sometimes. We need training and conditioning in the areas that our muscles are weak and unused. It's important that we're conditioning our hearts to that which the Lord's heart moves for, 
his children, others, relationship. It's vital that we have on our own team people that love us, want us to grow, that see what the Lord sees in us, holds us accountable in love, and lets us know when we're acting out of bounds of love. Remain in training. Secondly, we need to remain in reflection. You know what keeps me humble? Remembering my own redemption story. It's a doozy. <laughs> to remember the path that I was on, that Jesus pursued me, loved me right where I was at, and brought me close to him, reminding me that I didn't have to keep living the way that I was living, humbles me every single time. We tell our youth here at Mission Church that they need to get into the word to remember their redemption and replenish their identity. This doesn't go away the older that we get. It's during this time of reflection of my own redemption story that I can remember the love that was greatly and without condition lavished and poured upon me so that I can then be a vessel of overflow for others. We should always come back to Jesus in thankfulness for the death that he rescued us from through his very own. In reflection with Jesus, we learn to take our thoughts captive when the world would speak negativity over us. When we're walking through a global pandemic, when we're struggling to find a job or pay our bills, when the unknowns of the future keep piling up and when we don't know how to deal with what's in front of us. When we spend time with Jesus in proximity, we learn in scripture who we're called to be. First Thessalonians tells us to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing and give thanks in all circumstances. When we have a practice of relationship with the Lord, we learn his voice. We can differentiate between his hope over our lives versus that of the enemy through the world, because both of them have a hope for you. We understand better his grace that he offers us instead of the performance model that the world would want us to buy into. This happened again to the disciples in the next part of Mark. It's Mark chapter 2, still will be in verse 23. One Sabbath day, as Jesus was walking through some grain fields, his disciples began breaking off heads of grain to eat. But the Pharisees said to Jesus, Look, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? Jesus said to them, Haven't you ever read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God during the days when Abiathar was high priest, and broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. He also gave some to his companions. So what Jesus is explaining here is that the need overrules the law. He's recalling a time when the people that were with David were hungry. And so David went in and asked the priests for this bread that was set aside only for them. Every seven days, new 12 loaves of bread were put out, and they were only to be eaten by the high priests. But they gave them to David and his companions because they were in need and they were hungry. Jesus explains that the need overtakes, overrules the law here. Meet the need. 27, it says, Then Jesus said to him, The Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people, and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even over the Sabbath. So here, walking through the grain fields, although the disciples weren't actually breaking the law, there's numerous exceptions as to why the disciples were allowed to pick the grain as they walked. Uh, back then, farmers were actually required to leave the edges of their field and not harvest from them. 
for the purposes of people traveling so that when they traveled, they could eat along their way. Also on this day of Shabbat that the Jews were celebrating, you weren't supposed to be harvesting, but harvesting involved tools and that's not what they were doing. They were walking just to feed themselves and take care of themselves as they traveled, eating by hand. The Pharisees had gotten so wrapped up in requirements that they weren't even seeing them straight. They weren't understanding this new thing that Jesus was trying to explain to them that he was doing. It didn't make sense. Jesus' point to the Pharisees again was love over law. He tells them the Sabbath was created to serve man, not the man to serve Sabbath. Love, a day that was created for you and I to enjoy God and the pleasures of this life that he's blessed us with, our friends, our family, nature. Don't get so caught up in the right or wrong of it that we end up losing the relationship. Church, remain in love. When we're near others who are close to Jesus, this is called discipleship. They serve as a reflection of him to us. And as we walk with Jesus and others, we become a reflection of him to them. This is the psychological idea behind mirroring. That As we are in relationship and conversation with one another, we begin to actually mirror back to each other uh, what we're doing and how we're feeling. So church, let me ask you, who and how are you reflecting to others? This is what scripture actually tells us about mirroring. 2 Corinthians 3 verses 16 through 18 says, But whenever someone turns to the Lord... The veil is taken away, for the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed in His glorious image. So are we conditioning ourselves for the work of love? Are we meditating on the word of love? Are we surrounding ourselves with people who have walked with Jesus, who can teach us his voice and remind us who we are? Jesus didn't shy away from sharing truth with his followers or the people that he would encounter, but he did so with proximity. He did it in closeness through relationship. As we heard last week through Pastor Ezra's message, uh, his teaching of the man lowered into the home to be healed of paralysis. Jesus loved first. Interwoven and into all of these stories, we see in each of them that Jesus has a supernatural ability to remain in love. He remained in love when he met the Pharisees where they were, uh, speaking to them about something that they would understand, the wedding day, being with the groom, to draw them into something greater than what they had ever known. He remained in love as he explained that he brought something new to them, the greatest love, him. He remained in love as he walks along with his disciples, listening to their stories and teaching them, talking with them, and telling them how to share about the greatest love before he went to go to the cross. A love that allows access for everyone. And as we orient ourselves back to the world, are we reflecting our Savior or standards? Do we look like listening, walking, grace, and love? Or do we look like rules and regulations, rungs of a ladder that are meant to be climbed for greater accomplishment? 
Because when we walk with people, it's really messy. Sometimes between the I said yes to Jesus and the death that we face on earth, it gets really chaotic. Things happen that we don't foresee. Uh, Things happen that we actually walk right into (laughs) because we're in a process of transforming. We need to cling to this rule of relationship. Love over law. When I was 22 years old, I was alone and I was pregnant. I had just moved back from LA to Oregon where I had taken a year to check out California and just make a bunch of mistakes. I had just enough of a job to pay for the apartment that I had and the things that I wanted to do. I was scared out of my mind. And while I was scared, then I had to tell those who were closest to me. Now, for someone who has always held themselves to the laws of perfection but seemed to somehow have a knack for missing it every single time and falling short, this was nerve-wracking. This was not something that I wanted to venture out on. And I really didn't think that anyone could say anything to me that was worse than what I was saying to myself that I was wrong. I actually had received a family member's letter that let me know that I was a disgrace. I didn't meet the standards of my family. I was heartbroken. That was one of the hardest days, the worst. But the day that I told my dad had a completely different landscape. At a small restaurant in Clackamas, Oregon, I sat him down in public, of course, because I'm, I'm not stupid. I'm going to share something so difficult with him. I'm going to meet him in a public place, right? And the first thing he said to me was, I love you. What are you going to do? He remained in love. The last thing that he said to me was, it's going to be okay and I love you. I have no idea what he said in the middle. 17 years later, I know that we talked for about an hour, and I can't remember a single other thing that we talked about. Only that he told me how much he loved me, and that he didn't ridicule me for what I was walking through. Before my daughter was born that year, I gave my life to Christ. And after she was born, I was baptized. Jesus loved first. When he went to the cross for you and I, knowing full well what we'd meet along the way and sin temptation and what we would fall into, he loved first and offered himself instead of us to pay the cost for our choices. Remain in love. Fight the humanness of our flesh that would make us defendants of laws and rules and regulations. Remain a witness of Jesus' unconditional love, exclaiming the debts that he saved us from and beaming with joy because of the gift of grace offered to us through his sacrifice. Today, if you have a relationship with Jesus, would you just take a moment to reflect on your own story? Just quietly where you're at, praising him and thanking him for all that he's done and brought you through. But if you're watching today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I want to offer you a moment to respond to the greatest love story ever known. The love story of the one true God of the universe who became human to live and to die for you on the cross, to redeem us from death. 
and then to rise again so that we would have life with resurrection power. If this is you today and you want to make a decision to follow Jesus, would you bow your head and say this prayer with me? Just wherever you are, in your mind or out loud, Jesus, thank you for redeeming me. I've been apart from you in death, and today I believe with my heart and confess with my mouth that you are my Savior. I need you. Thank you for being Lord over my life. If you made this decision today, we want to celebrate with you. Would you text the words, never the same, to 94,000? Church, let's pray together this morning. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that we are your children. Thank you for this love story that you came to live out for us. Teach us to love like you, to see our neighbor like you do, to reach out and walk with people in the mess of this life. Help us to train and grow to be more and more like you. Thank you for the call of love you have on everyone's life who is watching. Would you grow the tender seeds of their heart and who they are in you to live boldly in love. We thank you for blessing them today. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. This Wednesday, we're having a night of worship and prayer right here in the building. We love to worship, and opportunities like this where we get to come together and seek His presence as a body are so special. The doors will open at 6, and we'll get started at 6.30. So come and join us on the 17th. What's up, church? Hey, we are so excited to let you know that on Friday, March 5th, we're going to have our next team night. This is for anyone that serves on any of our teams here at Mission Church. So if you lead a group, if you are part of the greeting team, the worship team, the kids team, any team whatsoever, we want to celebrate with you. We want to honor you and thank you. We want to share some exciting things with you. Uh, so make sure to mark your calendars for March 5th, and we'll have a whole lot more information coming soon. We cannot wait to celebrate with you guys that night.
Jesus.